This whole idea of, of God's will, if, if, you, if you kind of research the Bible, everything that everybody who contributed to this thing we call the Bible, all the people that have written over the, I think it's like 1,600 years or something, the whole writings are this long period of time, you discover that, that the will of God it comes in three categories. The first one is called the providential will of God. Now, you won't find that anywhere in your Bible. That's, that's just something kind of made up. But it describes this idea that there's this providential will of God, that God at times just decides, I'm going to do this. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to do it. I'll, I'll find somebody to do it. If I can't find somebody, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Uh, when, when he comes to uh, free, free his people from all these hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt, and he sends a spokesman for him, a guy by the name of Moses, to go talk to Pharaoh. And the basic message is, you need to let God's people go. And God says, you're going to let them go. It's just going to be, you know, you're going to decide when, but at some point you're going to let them go. And, and it, it keeps amping up, and God ultimately frees them, and there's these miraculous things that happen. And this idea that God is going to do some things just because he's God. It's, it's almost like, remember when you were a kid and your dad would, you'd be watching the TV program, your dad come in and turn the program, and you're like, hey, what's up with that? And your dad would say something like this, I'm the dad. My house, I get my TV, I get to watch what I want when I watch, right? That's kind of this. It, it isn't necessarily a fair thing. It's just, this is what God's going to do, and, and he's going to do it whether, whether we like it or not, whether we want to say yes or no to it, it's just going to happen. That's the providential will of God, the things that are going to happen because God wants them to happen. Next one is the prescribed will of God. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this idea that God has revealed some things, some, some, defines some things of what he hopes we will follow, do in life. The whole, it's kind of the moral, the ethical uh, prescriptions that are laid out in the Bible. You know, don't do this, do this, right? Um, all of those pieces flow together. And those are pretty clear. I mean, oftentimes God will say, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to command you to do this, right? This is what I want you to be, be part of you as a, as a follower. Jesus will say, you know, these are the two commandments. I'll, I'll take the 10 and put them down to two. But on top of that, I'm going to say love is a really key element. In fact, I want you to love others as I have loved you, which is a whole kind of other kind of love. And then the third category is the personal will of God. God's personal will for individuals. And let's be honest, out of that list of three, which one is the one we care the most about? Number three is the one we care the most about, right? Let's be honest. Because we want to, you know, yeah, okay, you know, God's got us, he's going to do his thing, right? And I understand this stuff I'm supposed to do, but really, God, what, what, is she the one? Not her. How about this one? How about this one? None of them? Is there anyone, right? You know, where should I, what should I work? You know, what should I do? And we think about all these decisions and we wish that somebody would just, you know, shine a light, show us clearly, this is the school I want you to go to. This is the, the degree I want you to get. This is the job I'm going to have for you, right? This is the person. This is the place. All of those things, that's the one we have the biggest question of. You know, God, what is your plan? What is your will for my life? Now, here's the interesting thing about that question, because it's a, it's a real thing that a lot of us wonder about, ask about. Um, the interesting thing is this. That's a question we ask. It's not one they ask. And today I'm talking about, if you read the people that wrote the Bible, the people that are around those times, you, you never get this sense of somebody coming to God and saying, God, what's your plan for my life, right? You know, I've been told my whole life I'm special. My parents, you know, raised me saying, you have a plan for my life, so what is it, Right? Nowhere do you find that, which is a little frustrating because it's such a big question for us. Why isn't it a question for them? And the answer is nobody. I was hoping somebody would have an answer. I have no idea. It, but for us, it's kind of a thing, right? But for them, it doesn't seem to be a thing because it never shows up in anybody who writes a stuff that says, hey, by the way, I was looking for God's will, and this is what God's did. Oftentimes, God shows up and says, this is my will for you, and people try to figure out, okay, how do I fit in that? What, is this really true? How does this all work? God, what is your plan? What is your will for my life? So today I thought we're just going to do kind of a flyby over um, a number of places in this thing we call the Bible, this book we call the Bible, uh, both the old, what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament part, just to see ways that people ask that question or at least maybe tried to answer it, not in the way we ask it as what's, what's your will for us. Typically it's about God, what's your will so that we can match up with it as opposed to God, tell me what your will is for me. What's the special plans you have for me? Because sometimes God does have a special plan for people, and he makes that really clear. For example, uh, Genesis chapter 12 talks about a guy named Abram, who will later be known as Abraham. And this is, this is what we know about the story. God comes to this guy, Abraham, Abram at that time, and says to him, 
Leave your country, leave your relatives, leave your father's family, the father's house, because typically they live in these kind of communes of their families, right? And go to the land I will show you. God shows up and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pack your bags and take off. And oh, by the way, I'm going to take you someplace. I'm not going to tell you exactly where. I'm going to show you as you're on the way there. Which seems like a big ass, doesn't it? I mean, this is, this is his country. This is where he's from, right? He's got his family here, all of his relatives. You know, this is where his life's at. At this point, he's married. You know, this is, this is where he's at. And God says, this is my plan for your life. This is one of those providential things. This is going to happen. And I'd like to have you on board, but you know, if you want to be on board, this is what's going to take place. But there's a second part that God gives him a little glimpse of what his plan for Abram is. He goes on and says, I will make you a great nation. It sounds like a pretty good thing, right? And I will bless you and I will make you famous, your name great, so that you will be a blessing to others. So you're not just famous for being famous, but you're famous for a reason, because how you're going to live your life, what, what your offspring are going to do for people. All the people on earth will be blessed through you, which sounds like a, a great promise. Um, one challenge to this promise is Abraham's been married for quite a while at this point, doesn't have any kids. But the person writing the story down tells us, so Abram left Haran as the Lord had told him. And oh, by the way, Abram was 75 years old. Which for some of us, 75 years is like old, 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 right? Because for some of us, 35 is old, 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 right? But, you know, 75 is up there. Let's, let's at least agree on that, right? 75 years, imagine yourself at 75 years old. You know, you're bumping around your house. You know, you walk down the hallways and you're kind of bouncing between them to kind of keep directed. You know, play a little golf every day, right? See the grandkids, you know, maybe at this point, great grandkids you could be, right? And all of a sudden, God comes along and says, hey, I got a plan for you. Pack up your stuff and head on out. Get in the car and head. To, well, I'll tell you where to head. Just get in there and, you know, I'll guide you. And, oh, by the way, you're going to have a whole, you're going to be this great nation. And at this point, you don't have any kids. So forget the grandkids I told you about earlier. But now you're just kind of going, right? Pretty incredible, right? There's no sign from God. God just simply says, this is what I want you to do. And Abram says, yes. Which brings us to another story in the Old Testament that's one of my favorites. And it if you've been around a place like this for much of your, your life, you've probably heard this story. In fact, it's, it's a, this particular guy does something that a lot of us begin to think maybe that's the way to find out what God wants for our life, is to follow this guy's plan. So this is about a story about a guy named Gideon. Here's the, the back story. Um, his group of people, his little clan is here. Uh, the, uh, some other nation, I think it's the Midianites, they've come and they keep raiding their their lands, and nobody's happy, and they can't really fight back because they're not that big of a group. And God shows up one day and says um, something to this guy named Gideon. Oh, by the way, he's just out working. He's, he thrashes some grain. You know, he's just going about business in life. And we're told that the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he says these words to him. Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty, courageous warrior. Which as soon as Gideon hears that, that last phrase, the mighty, courageous warrior, he thinks, I think the angel has the wrong address. Because that's not me. I'm a, yeah, I'm a farmer. I'm just crushing some wheat here. I, I'm no mighty warrior, right? In fact, I want you to notice how he responds. Gideon says to the angel, uh, sir, time out. If the Lord is with us, why are we having so much trouble? Why has all this happened? Which is a question we ask, right? That's not just, you know, this is kind of a people thing. You know, hey, God, if you're with us, what's up, Right? Why is all this bad stuff? I mean, we were supposed to be your people and all this stuff's happening. Now, if you read the story, you find out that a prophet's come along and said, hey, there's a reason for this, and that's, you know, you people aren't following God like you know you're supposed to. The prescribed will of God we talked about, you're not beating up that, so this is why this all happened. So he's like, but hey, God, if you're with us, why isn't this going on? I mean, where are the miracles, right? Where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Show up, right? Show us the signs so we can, you know, believe this stuff. I mean, they said, didn't the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Remember that big miraculous stuff? That was great back then, but what about right now? But now, he goes on, the Lord has abandoned us, has handed us over to the Midianites. To which I want you to notice how, how compassionately 
The angel answers Gideon. How, how much he, he answers all these questions of what's up, where are you at in this stuff? Because he says, the Lord says to Gideon, uh, go with your strength and say that it's deliver Israel from the Midianites. Your job, this is what I'm calling you to do. Wait, wait, what about the sign, right? What about all the questions I asked about why this is going on? And then the God through the angel simply says, am I not sending you? <clears throat> Your answer for all the stuff, where's God at? I'm here, and aren't I the one telling you, go do this, you know? Find something and go do your battle. <clears throat> to which Gideon answers like we, I think, would answer. And he says, uh, again, time out. Lord, how can I save, how can I deliver Israel, right? <laughs> I mean, how is this possible? By the way, my family group, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least important member of my family. Again, you picked the wrong boy, right? A whole lot of other guys, much better equipped, better. My family isn't strong, and I'm like the weakest in my family. We're just, you know, we're a bunch of wimps, and I'm the wimpiest of the wimps. I think he got this wrong. To which the Lord answers him and simply says, I will be with you. <laughs> which again is comforting on one side, but it's sort of forgetting. It's like, I'm kind of messed. So what happens in the story now? Gideon says, hold on, can you give me just a moment? Can you stay here? Let me run and get some stuff. I want to do an offering. And back then, an offering was some unleavened bread and some meat. And so he runs back to his house. He comes out, brings lunch out there. He puts it down on this rock. The angel burns lunch, just fries it up, which is convincing of Gideon that, OK, this is serious stuff. This is an angel from the Lord. OK, I need to get about business. So the story goes on that Gideon kind of takes the call. And he recognizes that one of the reasons that things aren't going so well is that his people have gotten off course. They've They've, they're worshiping other gods. So he goes down and tears down a bunch of uh, you know, idols that are around the town. He tears them down. Everybody gets mad at him. Um, and then uh, the next thing that happens is the Midianites gather like it's raid time again. And Gideon's worried about that. And so the angel shows up again. And Gideon says to him, actually says to God, it's described here, you said you would help me save Israel. This is what you told me. I'm just repeating what you said. This is your plan for my life. You're, you're going to help me save Israel. I have no idea that's going to work. But here, let me, let's do this thing, God. Look, I will put some wool, a, a wool fleece on the threshing floor. This coat of a, of a sheep, right? And if there's dew only on the wool, on the fleece, but all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will use me to save Israel, as you said. So here's what I'm going to put this thing down, you know. If that's wet tomorrow morning, but the ground's dry, that's the miracle I'm looking for. And it happens just like he asked for it. To which, if you've been thinking about that, you recognize that was not the best sign to ask for, right? Because if you go home tonight and you pull a, put a, a, a lamb skin out in your back porch and you want to see if it's wet tomorrow morning and the ground around it's dry, if you go out at the right time, it will be wet and the ground will be dry. Nothing bracket about that is just physics, right? Wool absorbs stuff, right? So Gideon comes back and says, wait, 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 hold on. God, don't be angry with me if I ask just one more thing, right? Please let me make one more test. Let me kind of screw this thing up, God. Let me, let, me, let me change the whole plan, right? Let's do it the other way. Let's let only the wool be dry while the ground around it gets gets wet would do. That would be a much more miraculous thing because it wouldn't make sense for the wool to be dry. And so <laughs> the story tells us that, that that night God did the very thing. Just the wool, the fleece was dry, but the ground around it was wet with dew. And that's one of those interesting stories because it's sort of like, oh, hey, maybe that's, maybe that's the way we figure out what God wants us to do is this whole fleece thing. Any of you ever do a fleece thing? Thank you. All right, a few of us have, right? Which is this idea of, you know, how do we make decisions? How do we know what God wants to do? Is there a test? Is there a miracle? Is there a sign? Show us something, God, right? So we're going to go to New Testament now. Um, the situation is, uh, this is just after Jesus has um, gone back to heaven. The, the, this book of Acts is a description of the early, the start of the church as we know it. Um, 
In chapter one, it talks about that Jesus goes back and they, they're told to go and wait for the next instructions back in Jerusalem. So there's like 120 people that are gathered there. They're praying, they're waiting for God to show up. And as they're there, the now 11 disciples think to themselves, hmm, there were 12 of us before, now there's 11. We need to get back to the number because that's the number Jesus picked. So let's just stick with what Jesus said. 12 of us, let's get us, let's find somebody, right? In fact, they say to the whole group, listen, so now a man must become a witness with us of Jesus being raised from the dead. We have to have somebody who joins us. And there's some requirements. He must be one of the men who were part of our group during all the time the Lord Jesus was among us, that he went out now, that Jesus was, you know, this whole time we were Jesus, the last three, three plus years, he's got to be, have been here through all of it, right? From the time when John was baptizing people until the day Jesus was taken up from us to heaven, right? We got to have somebody who's experienced the whole thing. So as I look around this group of 120 people, apparently they can only come up with two people because they put two names before the group. One is a guy by the name of Joseph Bersabbas, who's also called Justice. If you read much of your Bible, you know that people had like multiple names back then. And the other one was Matthias. Two guys that apparently had been there, maybe the only two guys that had been there for the whole thing. These are the two they put up. So how do they figure out which one's which? Which one has God choose? Luke, as he writes this, says that the apostles prayed to God. Lord, you know the thoughts, the hearts of everyone. Kind of starting off by God, you know everything, right? You know all about us. So show us which one of these two you have chosen to take this position and be an apostle in place of Judas, right? God, which one do you pick? So they pray about it, and then they do something beyond praying about it. They do a thing that we see sometimes happening in the Old Testament. They throw, they, they cast lots. They ca and then they cast lots and choose between them, and the lot showed that Matthias was the one, which had to kind of suck for the other guy, right? Because he's like, I've been here the whole time, and how do I, you know, and we're really going to decide over a game. How about two out of three, right? I mean, it's got to be, he gets cut out, right, by, by somebody throwing, it could be like sheep's knuckles was, you know, lots was, wasn't just pulling, you know, sticks. It was casting something and reading how it came out, and that's what it's like. So Matthias becomes an apostle with the other 11. So maybe, maybe that's the way we ought to decide things. Throw in lots. Maybe, maybe get, a, get a coin, right? That's kind of our motto. Rock, paper, scissors, whatever thing. Maybe that's the way that God speaks to us. Which brings us to a little bit later in the story of the start of the church. Um, a couple years later, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. So there were some, some important people that were at this church of Antioch. And it gives us a list of the names. There's... Uh, Barnabas, there's Simeon, also called Niger, which means black. So we got a, a, a guy that's probably of African descent, Lucius from Cyrene, that's a northern African, uh, Manian, who grew up with Herod, the ruler, and Saul. So we got these one, two, three, four, five guys. And they're at this church and they're deciding, okay, what's the next step? We've started to get some churches, but now we need to go out and try to spread this message all over the place. And so the description that happens here is they were, they were all serving, they were all worshiping the Lord and fasting. So maybe there's a key there, serving or worshiping and fasting. Maybe, maybe that's the answer. Because during this time, the Holy Spirit said, and we don't know how the Holy Spirit said, if it was outside a loud voice or just sort of, they all came to the same conclusion, said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to do the work which I have chosen them. So this time, no fleece, no, no lots, just simply the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And again, whether this is an audible voice they hear or whether it's just the impression, the conclusion they come to, they're told to pick Barnabas and Saul. So we're told after they fasted and prayed, so there's that idea of fasting again, and praying, they lay their hands on Barnabas and Saul and they sent them out. And then the book of Acts is a description as they go out. And you would think maybe, maybe that's the key here. Maybe this is the way we need to to pray and to fast or to, to worship and fast or to serve and fast, whichever one of those th three options we get from this particular occasion, maybe that's the way we can figure out what God wants us to do to figure out God's will for our lives. Because we think if we figure out God's wills, everything's gonna go great. You gotta go back and read the story of Saul and Barnabas. They go out and it's kind of this interesting story. They go out, 
they sell over here, they start a church here, they go here. Then all of a sudden they run into a, a, sort of a, a run of what seems like unfortunate luck because for whatever reason they're prevented from going into a number of different places. And, and they credit to that God stopped us. The Holy Spirit has told us we can't go there. So everything's going good, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's not letting them go. They've just got a sense they can't go to some of these places. And then, then they decide to go back and visit all the churches they've been working, you know, starting up over these last couple of years. And as they decide to go back, um, there's this big argument that happens. So two people that were handpicked by God have a huge argument, a huge falling out, so much so that they split into two different groups. Because what happened with Saul and Barnabas, Barnabas, who's this guy who's known as this encourager, you know, he's one of those optimistic guys, you know, always behind everybody. And he wants to bring along a guy named John Mark, who's a cousin of his, who had gone on an earlier trip with them, but at some point had bailed out on him. And we don't know the details of why he bailed out. Saul, who's now Paul, is having none of that. He like, guy didn't stay with us before, not doing this again. Fool me once, right? Second, not going to happen. And so there's this huge argument. These two guys split up. And they go in separate ways. And then you read Paul, and he talks about going here and here and these, these different things. And then ultimately, Paul will say one of his last things in Acts. He says, it's clear to me that God wants me to go to Jerusalem where it's going to go a lot of trouble, and I'm going to get thrown in jail. Again, seems kind of weird that that fits as part of this whole thing of what God wants for him to do. But it clearly, sometimes God's plan for us isn't all peaches and cream isn't all wonderful, right? Isn't the, you know, the BMW and the, you know, f- you know, five bedroom house with the pool and, you know, the, the great job, you know, it's not always those kinds of things. Now, the reason I want us to look at these multiple, we could have spent, we could spend the rest of the day looking, there's a bunch of them, right? These different ways that God has spoken to God has expressed his will, Right? We didn't look at the, you know, the, the bush that burns that doesn't burn up. We didn't look at the donkey that, that speaks to somebody, right? Uh, and, and so many different other ones. But here's the caution I want for all of us to be aware of. There's a temptation for us to take the unique and make it the norm. Because we're, we're so desperate for God to turn it around, to, to give us some direction. We go looking for, what is it, what is it, how has he already done it? He's done it this way. He's done it. So maybe he'll do those things again. And the problem with making the unique the norm is that we end up disappointed in God because he doesn't do what he didn't promise to do. What if one of the reasons we don't really clearly understand God's will is we're asking it in a way that not how we normally respond? So I'm going to give you right now my list. There's no biblical passages to this. This is just over my years, the things I've picked up on, at least for myself and when I've talked to others about things I encourage them to, if you're trying to figure out God's will, God's plan for your life, um, you know, what should you do? So let me just go through them. I'm just going to share with you free of charge today. Here we go. Uh, stay open and willing. I think one of the best things we can do is just be open to God, right? That if, you know, kind of open to any idea that might pop up, even if it's something that we're not so sure about, Let's be open. I think being open and willing, being, being willing to follow God wherever he leads is the key to this. A willing spot will put us in a great spot. Another way to put this is looking for a yes and being okay with a no. Because if you've ever got some opportunities and think, hey, is this something from God? And it looks like it and you get all worked up and it's a no. It's like, ah, uh, right? So just kind of open and willing to work where God might use us. Second one is simply this, use brain. which is one I kind of try to remind myself pretty often, right? Engage your brain. Engage what you know about God, what you know about life. You know how all those things have worked. You know, to, to evaluate the opportunities, the situation, the upsides, the downsides. You know, get you, get you a piece of paper. What are the upsides of doing this? What are the downsides? You know, talk to the people you need to talk to that are going to be impacted by this. Figure those things out. I think God has given us a brain for an important reason, so that we we'll use it, right? Uh, next one, uh, connect the dots. And what I mean by this is simply, you know, where does God seem to be leading? You know, sometimes something happens for us and this next opportunity fits what's happened, right? And now we're better equipped for it and we see some stuff happening and it seems like this is kind of where the picture's getting a little clearer. So maybe it's a moment to kind of connect those dots that God's already been doing in our life. 
Uh, one of the ones I rely on pretty regularly is this one. You know, sometimes, you know, they do this in game shows, right? Give you the option to phone a friend, right? Go phone somebody that you think might have the answer. That's oftentimes a really good idea. And when I say friends, I don't mean the knuckleheads we normally hang around with. You know, because we, we can always get people around us who, who will agree with us and tell us yes. What you need is what I call uh, somebody who can tell you you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny, friend. This is a friend, some friends I developed in college who are those kind of friends for me, right? And we would kind of joke about that. We kind of are lying, hey, you're ugly and your mother dressed you funny. We just kind of, but it's this idea that somebody who, will, who, who gives you some wise counsel, someone who knows you and will tell you the truth, whether you like it or not, because you need to hear the truth. Those kinds of friends are invaluable. Somebody who's not worried about hurting your feelings because they know that you know that they care about you, that they got your best interest heart. And finding some people like that, and more than one, you need to have, you know, two or three, you need to have some people in different areas, right? People in the areas maybe where you work for that kind of advice, you know, people for some life, some, some older people, some younger people, some people that, that just, you know, will tell you the truth. Because what I've learned over life is that I don't always know everything, I don't ever see everything, and I'm not always aware of everything. And having somebody else who may be can help me figuring out some of those things. My next one will be amazing and incredible. You all will write this one down. You'll take pictures of this one. That's a theological term, by the way. But don't poo-poo opportunities, right? Today's opportunities. You know, this is the, um, the grass isn't always greener, right? What's the old line? The grass is, is greener where you water it, Right? Sometimes, you know, we're tired of the weeds in our yard and we see this other thing and it seems so appealing and we get caught up in the whole motion of, oh, this is a great opportunity. And we miss that maybe the opportunity God has for us is the one we're currently in. Even though we don't like it, we don't think it's it. You know, what if, what if we took full advantage of our current opportunity rather than waiting for the next one? Because I think sometimes when we think about God's plan, we're like, okay, God's plan is something else, something different. And sometimes it's, no, the exact same thing, just maybe thinking about it in a different way. So I'm going to tell you a, a story now, my story, and how I got here. When I say here, I don't mean to this planet, right? Because I don't know all the details of that. I don't really want to know all the details of that, honestly. Let me just tell you how I got to New Hope. And I'm going to tell you how I have processed some of these big questions of how do you know what God wants you to do? Because I'm convinced now that I should be here because I love this place. The best place I've ever been. But I want you to know before I came here, I was at the best place I'd ever been up to that point. <laughs> and so it was actually almost about 12 years ago now. I think it was kind of, a, I want to say late August, if I remember right. I got a phone call out of the blue from somebody who I've never met before, didn't he? I can't even tell you the name because I don't remember their name now, but worked at uh, the Chesapeake Conference, and if you're not familiar with our church, um, we have individual churches, but they're all part of what's called a conference, a, a bigger organization than us. This one covers most of Maryland, Delaware, a little slice of West Virginia. Uh, so I get this call, and the guy says, hey, Mike, uh, I'm so-and-so, and I'm just, uh, we're, we're currently making a list for possible people to uh, uh, be the senior pastor at the, at the New Hope Church. And I knew New Hope. I knew Dave Newman. Dave Newman and I used to work together years ago at, at our world headquarters. Um, and I'd seen Dave over the years at different conferences and stuff. So I knew a little bit about New Hope. And he's like, you know, we're just wondering if you, if you consider having your name on the list. He says, it's a long list, but they're just kind of starting to compile it. And I'm like, okay, sure. Because I kind of told myself before, I'll always be yes, open to God, right? Even though I may not want to be open at the moment, I always ought to be open, just because God may want to do something, right? So I'm like, sure, right? Because the reality is, at that moment, I wasn't open. And, and I didn't want to be open because, like I said, I was at a really good church. Um, it was you know, time to get ready for one of our big events we did at this particular church. We did two big events in our community. I uh, have to understand, a much more rural community than where most of us live here. Um, and because it's a rural community, a little more, you know, closed in, a little more impact you could have. Um, and so it was the only church I've ever pastored that, A, everybody in town 
knew about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and B, everybody had a good opinion of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, only place I've ever lived. And it was based on the two big events that that particular church had done for uh, years before I got there and all the years I was there and a year or two after I was there. They did a, um, a big, they told the story of Jesus' birth and they told the story of Jesus' uh, life, death, burial, and resurrection. Um, you know, like we do here at Easter, they did Christmas, but their Christmas thing was outside um, and it was a walk-through experience and they would get over 7,000 people through their doors in four nights. Um, it, it was a huge event. Again, it left such a positive feeling because it was not, it was just simply, here's the story, right? And it was this great tell, telling, experiential telling of the story. And so we were getting stuff ready for that. And personally, uh, my wife Lori had um, been diagnosed with ovarian cancer the previous spring, had just gone through months of grueling chemotherapy, um, and was coming out the other end of that, and everything was looking like it was going to be okay. Um, and so she was, she was not physically in any kind of state to think about moving. We had a good support system, people that had really rallied around as Lori went through that, as we both went through that. Um, and so I really wasn't open. So, but I'm thinking, hey, this is late August. He's told me a big list. It'll be months before I, if I ever heard anything, right? I, I don't even know how I got my name on the list. So my name gets on the list, and I want to say it was weeks, not months, but it was weeks later. It was like... Um, Late September, I get this phone call from um, uh, the conference president here, Rick Rimmers, who was a guy I had gone to graduate school with. And Rick says, hey, Mike, uh, they want to set up a, a, a video interview with you. And I'm like, why? And he's like, well, because he, he kind of made it to the top of the list. And they want to, you know, just they're kind of getting it down. And they want to have a chance before they brought you out to do it. And I'm like, I really don't think they want to do that, Rick. I think they ought to keep looking. And he says, well, they really have decided they'd like to have, you know, talk to you. And I'm like, all right. So I say, okay, um, well, how about uh, this day? It was like a Tuesday or something. Um, going to be at the office. I'm going to be the only one there because, you know, you want to kind of be private when those kind of discussions happen. So they called me up. And, and one of the, I remember, I don't remember who all was part of that group. I just remember one of the first questions they asked was, why do you want to come to New Hope? <laughs> and my answer was, I don't. To which they followed up, I don't know why, and they said, why does your wife want to come to New Hope? And I said, she doesn't. <laughs> so we talked. I, it wasn't a long interview. We kind of talked. I kind of told them my philosophy of, of church and how I did things, and I get done, and by the time I get home, I get a phone call from Rick who says, they want you to come out and do a live interview. <laughs> to which I'm like, I think they really need to keep, Rick, you need to go back and tell them they need to keep looking, right? Because... I said, you know, by now it's, it's uh, early October. We're getting into, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and Christmas is a huge deal at that particular church. And so I'm like, I got a bunch of stuff going. I, I just, there's no way I can fit this in. I said, listen, I have a trip planned. I'm coming out to New York City with one of my sons. We're going to go hang out there for a week. Um, I said, listen, I can come. I can add a day or two on the end of my vacation come down and, and interview with them if that's, if that's what they want. But really, I think they ought to keep looking. So he said, okay, let's do that. So I hang out with my son in New York City, have a great time. I uh, drive down here, I interview upstairs. Uh, and you know, they ask me a lot of the same questions. You know, Why do you want to come? And I'm like, I don't. And they, we go through the whole process again. I'm, I, one of the great things about when you're not looking for a job, you can be honest about Stop, right? I was, I was honest. I mean, I tend to be honest anyways. If you ask me my opinion, I'm going to tell you it, right? If you ask me an idea on something, I'm going to tell you it. So I, I kind of give it all. Um, I get done, and Rick says, um, calls me. I think he was heading back to the hotel, and he says, well, they want to invite you to come. And I said, no, Rick. <laughs> no, they don't. No, you really need to. T and I told the group, I said, you really need to keep looking. I'm, I'm just not, not there. So I said, listen, give me a couple of weeks. So I figured, okay, I got to give God some room here, right? I, my, my answer is no because of all the other circumstances. So I get home, Lori and I talk, and um, at the same time this is all happening, at my previous church, we, one of our, our pastoral staff had, had taken a job in another spot. So we had an opening coming up, and I had already been talking to some people, been researching some folks. Um, I talked to the, our office and said, hey, all good for this? Oh, yeah, all good for this, all good for this. Oh, by the way, you need to come into this meeting. Just standard practice. We just sit down and talk, but 
won't have any impact on any of this stuff. So I, I say, okay, I get the date for that. I make the, I tell Rick it'll be after that meeting. Uh, so Lori and I talk, and we, and we decide we're going to go the Gideon method because you've got to have some kind of method, right? So we say, this is our fleece. This is our, our thing. I've been told in writing and in person by our conference administration, nothing to worry about filling this position at your church. So, and I got an interview lined up just when I get done with the interview or within the discussion at the conference office to interview somebody for that spot because I'm expecting all to work out. So we say, if, if something changes this, that's clear because I've been told everything's good, not going to happen, nothing's going to change. So I get there to this meeting, weirdest meeting I ever had at the conference office. I walk in, they give me a piece of paper, they say, find your name on it, I find my name, it's got the church, it's got the numbers, and they say, well, according, you know, according to those numbers, you don't qualify for the amount of pastors you have. And I'm like, you emailed me, you've talked to me in person. What's up, right? And they're like, you know, well, here's the problem. You don't qualify. We can't imagine you with one less, and putting a half person there doesn't make sense. For an hour and a half, they told me that exact same story. Finally, I'm like, I, I, got, I, got, I guess I got my answer. I, I don't know what else to tell you, right? And they're like, you know, hey, if we can do a little song and dance to keep you. And I thought, all right, we're done. So I walked out, <laughs> get out the call. I call Lori, and they say, you're not going to believe what happened. I kind of tell her what happened. As soon as I get done talking to her, I call the, the guy I was going to talk to as an interview, and I said, there's no reason to have an interview because I don't have a position. So that was how I got here. <laughs> and the thing I want you to know about that is someone's story isn't everyone's story. So don't think the whole fleece thing is the way to go because that may or may not. I think you got to, my personal take is all of us have to figure out how God communicates to us. Because I've talked to enough people, I've read enough stories in the Bible that things are unique for individuals, different ways. I hear sometimes people say, God spoke to me. God has never spoken to me. But I hear people, you know, God spoke to me and told me this. And they're, they're convinced and I'm like, all right, maybe, you know, I'm, maybe that's how God, God, maybe God speaks audibly to you or through really strong impressions. Doesn't doesn't tend to be how it works for me. But we all need to figure out how God may be communicating so that we don't miss those calls, right? Amen. Amen. So let me all summarize this whole idea of looking for God's plan for life. What if what God is looking for is our willingness to follow? Because I'm convinced that's, that's the key. Why tell me your plan for my life if I'm not going to follow, right? But what if he's looking for is our willingness to follow his revealed will, right? Because that's part of it. And his will he may reveal. Because I go, keep going back to the words of Jesus that are uncomfortably clear. When I say uncomfortably is because our experience doesn't always match what Jesus said it was. But Jesus said it was this way, so I'm kind of stuck, right? As a follower of his. We looked at this last week, right? As he's talking about prayer and that thing that frustrates us when we don't get answers, he says, so I tell you, keep on asking and God will give it to you, which is like a complete sentence, right? Like, sounds like a promise. And keep on searching, keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will open for you. And so for those of us that consider ourselves followers of Jesus, what we're left with is that Jesus says, keep at it, and God will. Which I know some of us are thinking this right now. Because I talked to somebody this last week that was that way. And if you find yourself in that section where you feel like God's been maybe holding out on you, that isn't giving you the clear answer, even though it sounds like he said, keep at it. I want you to remind you, he, the words he used wasn't just ask and you shall receive. That's how some of your versions have it. The actual language is keep on asking. But this isn't just a one-time thing. This is a longer process. But what if, what if, is it possible that we've missed it, overlooked it? What if God's given us an answer, but we've missed it or overlooked it? Is that possible? Is it possible that we've resisted it, avoided it, or ignored it? 
Because I'm guessing for some of you, your experience is like mine, that sometimes I don't ask for God's opinion and will on something because I know what it is, and I don't want to really do it at the moment. I want to do my thing, my way. And maybe, maybe we don't like the answer, so we just keep asking, hoping for another one. Is that possible? And I'm not saying that the problem is with you, that you know, you're not praying hard enough, long enough, if you don't have enough faith. That's not the point. I'm just saying, is it possible that sometimes maybe one of the reasons we don't hear from God is, isn't because he hasn't said something. It's just that he hasn't said it in the way we want to hear it. Because what if, what if our asking, our searching, our trying is a big part of the answer God is trying to give us? Because if that's true, that could change a lot. Something to think about.